First things first, I want to re-congratulate the Kansas City Chiefs and three-time Super Bowl champion and Super Bowl MVP, the first African-American quarterback to do so, Patrick Mahomes. I'm going to keep. To, I'm going to continue to do that as far as long as I can, just for the pleasure of pissing off the right wing. I need to talk about this as well because the mainstream media right now is focusing on how old and how um, cognitively impaired Joe Biden might be, instead of focusing on the real issue that needs to be focused on. Donald Trump and his statements that he wants to break up the NATO alliance and allowing Russia to attack NATO nations and encouraging it. It needs to be talked about because quite honestly, the media is allowing this to continue. But instead of me ranting about it, I think Lawrence O'Donnell from MSNBC's The Last Word can do a better job, or at least a better job, than I can. Mr. O'Donnell, take him to church. Well, the flu has left him rather miserable and very tired, but he can't give into it. At about 1230, he was dropping with sleep and let me take him to the big chair by the fireplace and put his feet on the two-step stool. I went out to get ready for lunch, and he fell sound asleep. That was a description of the President of the United States by his cousin. In the middle of a workday, one year before he was reelected, when the President woke up from that much-needed nap, he went back to work on what turned out to be his brilliant strategies for winning World War II. He continued running the secret project depicted in the film Oppenheimer to develop an atomic bomb. He designed the operating structure of what would become the United Nations, and he was calling it the United Nations then. And he did all of that and much, much more while he was dying. Franklin Delano Roosevelt who by most historians is considered the best or second best president in history, depending on your view of Lincoln, was never a very healthy man since he was paralyzed from the waist down by polio at age 39. Polio was common enough in those days that reporters understood why Roosevelt spent every day of his presidency in a wheelchair. Before World War II started, President Roosevelt had already done more in domestic policy than all previous presidents combined. He created Social Security, a 40-hour work week, minimum wage, public works projects like the Tennessee Valley Authority, beyond any previous imaginable scale. And he led the country out of the Depression, bringing the economy back to life in the darkest time in American economic history. In 1944, with victory in World War II seeming at least a year away, President Roosevelt decided he had to run for re-election to finish the job, even though a doctor who had examined him earlier that year, said privately to the White House physician that he didn't think Roosevelt could survive a second term and might not survive the re-election campaign. The Republican campaign against Roosevelt relied on his appearance as a frail old man to underline their Republican campaign theme of replacing what they called the tired old men, the whole group of them in the administration, the tired old men in the White House. Roosevelt won. When Franklin Roosevelt died three months after his next inauguration, no one said, I wish I didn't vote for him. Not one person. The reporters who covered Franklin Roosevelt in the White House without ever screaming a single question at him cried when he died. They understood the real work of the presidency, which they were there to report on better, much better than most of the current White House press corps. The next Republican president of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, was the army general who executed every detail of Franklin Roosevelt's decision to turn the tide of World War II in Europe with what was the single largest military operation in human history, the D-Day invasion of the beaches of Northern France, depicted masterfully in Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan. One year before he was reelected, 
President Eisenhower had a heart attack after a day of golf in Denver. He didn't return to the White House for almost three months, and reporters took it in stride. It was just a heart attack. Not a word of what a disaster it was for the Eisenhower re-election campaign, for him to be knocked out of commission by a heart attack a year before the election. The only political speculation that appeared in the New York Times the day after the heart attack was by veteran journalist James Reston, who offered the informed speculation that President Eisenhower's family might not want him to run for re-election now. The political danger that Scotty Reston identified was the danger to the Republican Party if President Eisenhower didn't run for re-election, not if he did run for re-election. The conventional wisdom as captured by Reston in the New York Times was that Dwight Eisenhower was the only Republican who could win the next year. And so the heart attack was presented not as a political problem for Eisenhower, but as a political problem for the Repo Republican Party only if President Eisenhower let what doctors called a moderate heart attack stop him from running for re-election. President Eisenhower easily won his re-election campaign. One reason is the news media was better at stories like that in those days. Today, Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman published a column in the New York Times titled, Why I Am Now Deeply Worried for America. He says, quote, watching the frenzy over President Biden's age, I am, for the first time, profoundly concerned about the nation's future. It now seems entirely possible that within the next year, American democracy could be irretrievably altered, and the final blow won't be the rise of political extremism. That rise certainly created the preconditions for disaster, but it has been part of the landscape for some time now. No, what may turn this menace into catastrophe is the way the hand-wringing over Biden's age has overshadowed the real stakes in the 2024 election. It reminds me, as it reminds everyone I know, of the 2016 Fuhrer over Hillary Clinton's email server, which was a minor issue that may well have wound up swinging the election to Donald Trump. Paul Krugman doesn't say it explicitly in his column, but he is complaining about his employer, the New York Times. Here is a graph of press coverage of President Biden's mental fitness over three days at the end of last week. 33 stories in the Washington Post, 30 stories in the New York Times. And here is a graph of press coverage of Donald Trump confusing Nikki Haley for Nancy Pelosi. The important thing about the avalanche of stories about President Biden's age and the sharpness of his memory is that that story does not exist in a news desert competing only with the Super Bowl this weekend. It was competing with and losing to the single most important thing and the single most disqualifying thing ever said by a presidential candidate. On Saturday in South Carolina, Donald Trump talked about NATO in his typically lying way. He told the flawlessly uninformed people who attend his rally that he'd force other countries to pay money to NATO, something no other country has ever done. NATO does not collect money from countries. NATO encourages members to spend certain amounts, depending on their ability to pay, for their own national defense, on their own military, for their own armies, so that their armies will be ready to join other NATO countries' armies if another NATO country is ever attacked. The United States signed a treaty joining NATO in 1949. That treaty is the law of the land of the United States of America. It is law. Treaties are law. Donald Trump said on Saturday that while he was president, he promised to violate that law, to violate that treaty, and he made that promise to the unnamed president of another country. I came in, I made a speech, and I said, you got to pay up. They asked me that question. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. you got to pay. you got to pay your bills. So the statement... I would not protect you, describes a violation of American law. 
That treaty is American law. And then to say, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want, means Donald Trump would encourage, would have encouraged Vladimir Putin in Russia to attack any NATO country that he wanted to attack and do whatever the hell he wanted to do. And this is what Vladimir Putin wants to do. That is Vladimir Putin, war criminal, attacking, deliberately targeting hospitals in Ukraine. Donald Trump has seen that picture. Everyone in the world saw that picture in the first weeks of Vladimir Putin's savagery. Donald Trump knows exactly what Vladimir Putin wants to do. There were people in this country who were fans of Adolf Hitler. That statement makes it very clear that Donald Trump would have been one of them if he had just been born soon enough. The European precedent for what Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine is what Hitler did when he invaded neighboring countries in Europe. And Donald Trump is on the side of the invader. The hottest story, the definitive story of the 1976 presidential campaign was this moment in the presidential debate that turned the election in favor of Jimmy Carter. There is no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, and there never will be under a Ford administration. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, could I just follow? Did I understand you to say, sir, that the Russians are not using Eastern Europe as their own sphere of influence and occupying mo most of the countries there and, and, and making sure with their troops that it's, a, that it's a communist zone, whereas on our side of the line, the Italians and the French are still flirting with I don't believe, uh, Mr. Frankel, that uh, the Yugoslavians consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. I don't believe that the Romanians consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. I don't believe that the Poles consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. Each of those countries is independent, autonomous. It has its own territorial integrity. And the United States does not concede that those countries are under the domination of the Soviet Union. It was a disaster. President Ford got carried away. He was trying to convince voters that he was doing a great job managing and containing the Soviet Union. But voters knew that the Soviet Union was indeed dominating the entire region and voters in both parties were opposed to what the Soviet Union was doing. More newsprint was devoted to what Gerald Ford said that night than to anything Donald Trump has ever said because those were the days when words mattered. Those were the days when reporters knew what was serious. They knew what the central issues were in a presidential campaign, and they were not distracted by fireworks. That is the failure of the news media that Paul Krugman is so correctly worried about tonight. Any president prior to Donald Trump would have been impeached and removed from office immediately after telling that story that Donald Trump told on Saturday about his willful determination to violate the law by violating the NATO treaty. The stakes of this presidential election are not just what would happen here in the United States with a President Biden or a President Trump, but what would happen around the world, and now specifically what would happen to Ukraine, what would happen to Poland, what would happen to Finland and other threatened members of NATO without Joe Biden in the presidency to protect them. And as Joe Biden and Donald Trump make clear every day, Joe Biden is better on his worst day than Donald Trump is on his best day on every issue confronting the presidency from health care to NATO. And if you write about the President Biden's age without saying that, then you are doing a disservice to the truth. When the United Nations was created after World War II, Following President Roosevelt's design for that institution, it soon became clear that the Soviet Union, which achieved the status of permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations by being an ally of the British and the United States during World War II, was no longer going to behave like an ally. That a separate structure was needed to contain the kind of aggression in Europe that started World War II, aggression that could come from the Soviet Union. And so the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was born in 1949, 
and made law in the United States as a treaty. NATO is an extension of President Roosevelt's vision in building a permanent alliance to prevent European wars. One day before the 10th anniversary of Germany's surrender in World War II, President Eisenhower on May 6, 1955, welcomed Germany as the newest member of NATO. Ten years after the troops under General Eisenhower's command forced Germany to surrender, Germany signed a treaty promising to defend the United States of America if the United States were attacked or defend any other NATO country if that country were attacked. Donald Trump doesn't know that. Donald Trump doesn't know why NATO was formed. He doesn't know when it was formed. He doesn't know what NATO has accomplished. And he doesn't know that no country pays anything to NATO. Donald Trump wants to destroy the careful work of the winners of World War II. And you live in a country where the news media thinks Joe Biden's age is more important than that. You never know when a president is going to die. We lost Abraham Lincoln at age 56. We lost President Kennedy at age 46. We almost lost President Franklin D. Roosevelt before he was ever inaugurated. Lost him to a failed assassination attempt when he was president-elect. The bullet that could have killed the president-elect Roosevelt in his motorcade instead wounded the mayor of Chicago. The founders had a plan for that. It's called the vice presidency. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt looked like a frail old man in his 80s when he died in office. He was 63 years old. And on his last day of consciousness as president of the United States, he was still better at that job than any Republican who ran against him would have been. The mainstream media needs to continue to talk about this. Because I find a man who's 81 years old, who knows how to work the politics, who may be losing a couple of steps here or there, is much more capable of doing the job as president of the United States than a man who obviously has a political agenda, or more to the point, financial greed agenda, as Donald Trump. Now, yes, Joe Biden is old. However, I would take an old man who may lose a couple of steps than a man who has openly encouraged Russia, Vladimir Putin, a man who has the, the ambition of rebuilding the Soviet Union as his puppet. We are almost 260 days away from the 2024 election. Now, I have things about Joe Biden I might not like. But he's a damn sight better than a man who will sell this country and sell out our allies for cash. And that's exactly what Donald Trump did. If Lawrence O'Donnell didn't convince you of that in, the, in this video, I don't know what will. And I ask you to please share these videos because I'm not going to stop talking about this. It needs to continue. Because honestly, if Donald Trump gets back in the office, the world we know, the freedoms we enjoy, will die. A hard, cold death. CTP, know the truth. God bless. Peace to the left, justice to the right.